So when we left, this is the last paragraph, the last paragraph of chapter 51 of Little Rock So Lions of Little Rock. My face burned red and I willed myself to not, not to cry. Well, said Liz, letting go of Curtis's hand and winding her arm through mine. Better safe than sorry. Betty Jean opened the back door and held it open, gesturing for her husband to go inside. But then suddenly we heard a car pull up in front of the house. We all froze. There was a crash and the sound of breaking glass. A screech of wheels driving off. And then... Everybody. An explosion. Dot, dot, dot. Chapter 52. Afterwards. I'd been right. Something had happened after all. Something bad. I'd never known I could be so upset about being right. Mother reached for my hand. Her fingers were trembling. Everyone was silent. After a minute or two, the smell of smoke wafted out the back open door. Betty Jean glanced over at Pastor George. Stay here, he ordered, and he went back into the house again. Curtis moved to follow him, but Betty Jean grabbed his arm. You heard your father. The next door neighbor poked her head out a window. You all right? I, I think so. I, Betty Jean choked up and couldn't finish. Liz shook her head. Marley, if you hadn't said something. I glanced over at Liz. She was biting her lip, but I could still see it quivering. Curtis put his arm around her. Pastor George came back then. Someone threw a brick through our front window. It landed on the couch. From the damage to the living room, there must have been a couple of sticks of dust <coughs> too. And like a picture in slow motion, I could imagine it. Red, leaning out of it the window of his car, pitching a rock at us like he'd done with the eggs. The window shattering like the ice on a pond in spring and covering us all with little bits of glass. All of us standing frozen, shocked, glittering as the sun shone in the ruined window not noticing <coughs> until it was too late. We should call the police, said Mother. Betty Jean nodded, but she didn't move. I realized she was crying. Great big tears that flowed down her cheeks without making a sound. Pastor George sat down on a stump in the backyard and covered his face with his hands. I imagined, as a pastor, he'd had experience giving bad news to people. But it must have been different when it was your own wife and son. I knew I should be scared, too. We could have been killed. But all I could think was, The dynamite is gone. Red doesn't have any more. And no one was hurt. The next door neighbor came out then. She was old and tiny, shorter than me, with white hair and a lined face. I already notified the authorities, she said. You just tell me who else you need me to call. Liz's family arrived first. Her mother wore a yellow dress, which looked beautiful against her dark skin. Though half of the dress was wrinkled and the other half was not, as if she'd been ironing when she got the call. Her father was light-skinned and movie star handsome, like Montgomery Clift and Harry Belafonte rolled into one. I thought Liz might introduce me, but her father put his arm around her shoulders and her mother led her away, and only Tommy looked back at me and glared. Daddy ran up then and threw his arms around Mother and me. It was red, I said. He nodded and Mother started to cry. The old neighbor offered me a cup of coffee and I took it. My hands were cold, even though it was a warm evening, and it felt good to hold the cup. I tried to take a sip, but only managed to spill half the coffee on the ground. A few minutes later, the police arrived. There were two of them, an older man who went off with Pastor George to look at the damage in the house, and a young man with a mustache who seemed most interested in talking to Mother and me. I told the policeman everything about Liz and me running into each other at the zoo, at, and taking Red's keys, looking in his trunk, and... Oh, Marley! Mother exclaimed. It gets worse, I admitted. I told them about getting stuck in the trunk. My daddy sucked in his breath as I told him about the letter opener and forgetting the last two sticks and David coming to pick me up... And even though I knew I was going to get in trouble, I deserved to get in trouble. It still felt good to tell. Finally, I took a deep breath. Since I spent so much time in that car, I knew it when I saw it. 
and you know the rest. Silence again. The policeman gave me an odd look. Say something, I pleaded. I know I'm in trouble, but... Mother began to laugh then. A nervous, hysterical laugh. The police officer glared at my mother. You don't actually believe this nonsense, do you? What, said Daddy. It's ridiculous, stealing keys, climbing into a trunk. Who could believe a story like that? It's true, I said. You can ask Liz. If you're lying, I'm sure the colored girl will too. My daughter does not lie, said Daddy. You're saying it was Red Dalton, the football star, right? The police officer asked. I nodded. The policeman shook his head. No way he'd pull a stupid stunt like this. But what I'd like to know, he said, is why you are at this colored family's house. What does that have to do with... Daddy started. Mother put a hand on his arm. We were just dropping off some flyers. There's an election tomorrow. Was it some sort of integrationist meeting? Mother shook her head. And what if it was, snapped Daddy. Aren't you supposed to protect all of us? All citizens of Little Rock, he agreed. But if it was some commie meeting, my wife and 13-year-old daughter are not communists, said Daddy. Where is Sergeant Pike? Out of town, said the older officer coming out of the house. You were lucky. If anyone had been sitting by the window. No one wanted to finish that sentence. Numbers flowed through my head. Prime numbers, times tables, pi to as many digits as I knew. But I didn't help. The police didn't believe me. They weren't going to do anything. They were acting like Betty Jean should be grateful to only have a broken window and a burnt up couch. Chapter 53, The Election. It was late when we finally got home, way past dinner time, but none of us were hungry. Mother and Daddy said good night and headed off to their bedroom. Aren't you gonna punish me? I asked. Daddy crossed his arms. Doesn't seem to do much good. I'm sorry. Mother held up her hand. No, Marley, I'm too tired for this. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Tomorrow's the election. Then Tuesday, said Mother, and they closed their door. I slept badly that night, dreaming of bricks crashing through our front window, dynamite exploding, and Mother and Betty and Jean and Liz walking through our house with makeup on their faces and diamond tiaras. I wondered when my dream had turned into Cinderella's ball, but then I realized it was broken glass in their hair, and it wasn't rouge on their cheeks. It was blood. I called Liz first thing the next morning. Who is this? Liz's mother asked. Marley Nisbet, I admitted. Marley, she said softly. All I ever wanted was for Elizabeth to have the best education possible. But associating with you nearly got my daughter killed. She won't be talking to you again. Ever. But I... Mrs. Fullerton hung up the phone. It was hard to concentrate in school. JT wasn't there, and despite myself, I was kind of worried about him. Mr. Harding seemed distracted, too. He was teaching the class percentages, and he kept getting the problems wrong. Three-fourths was 75%, not 34%. I corrected them, him the first time, but he looked so embarrassed I didn't dare correct him again. Besides, no one else in the class was paying attention. I kept waiting for someone to mention what had happened at Betty Jean's, but no one did. Sally had a new haircut and dress and talked nonstop how she was going to get her pa picture in the paper at the cross victory party because she was, of course, she was sure her side would win. When I arrived home, there was a postcard from Judy in the mail. Good luck! Win the election and bring me home. Love, Judy. P.S. I need new laces for my saddle shoes. Black, please. Extra long. Shoelaces. Such a normal co concern. You voted? Betty Jean asked as I walked into the kitchen. Betty Jean, I said, I'm only 13. I'm asking everyone, she said without looking at me. She sniffed the air, then turned to the oven. As soon as she opened it, a puff of smoke drifted out. 
Oh, Lord, she sighed. This is the second batch I've burned this afternoon. Betty Jean asked. What? I wasn't sure what to say first. Betty Jean had kept my secret about going to the gym, and I'd repaid her by almost getting her killed. Are, are we going to talk about what happened yesterday? No. Betty Jean was scraping what appeared to be burnt cookies into the garbage. I'm sorry, I said. I know you told me to stay away from Liz, but... Marley, interrupted Betty Jean. What? I need this job. We're still paying back the money from when Curtis was arrested. And now we need a new living room, too. You know the best way to lose your job? I didn't answer. Yelling at the daughter of your employer. I don't want to do that. So I'd appreciate it if you'd kindly be quiet and leave me alone. A birthday. Oh, so my. How old are you? I'm done. Halfway to 20. <laughs> what do you got? I got cookie dough cake. Oh, <sighs> My aunt made it. Ooh. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. When was your birthday? Um, it's today. It's today, March 16th. Congratulations. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> wow, treats go on. Okay. That's like the third one today. Yeah, I know. I'm lucky. You're so lucky. So, it's not fair. But that wouldn't help with anyone. Not me, not Liz, and certainly not Betty Jean. I tried to imagine what Liz would do. You know, you know, I said finally, I think my parents would appreciate it if you'd yell at me. They haven't gotten around to it themselves, and I know I deserve it. So it'd save them the trouble. Betty Jean snorted and kept her eyes on the cookie. But I could tell she was trying hard not to smile. You're a strange girl, Marley. I'm so sorry, Betty Jean. I know, she said. I know. Mother, Daddy, and I listened to the results coming in on KLRA radio station throughout dinner and afterwards. I did my homework, Daddy graded papers, Mother did the dishes, and none of us said a word. The stop candidates were ahead all evening, but when KLRA went off the air at 12.30 a.m., it was still too close to call. I was sure I wouldn't be able to sleep, but I put my head around my pillow just to rest, and the next thing I knew, I heard the front door open as Daddy went out to get the paper. I washed my face and got dressed, anxious to know what had happened, at the same time dreading it. As soon as I walked into the kitchen, Daddy held up the paper. Stop wins recall victory! Perjures thrown off board! Mother grinned at me. Daddy said we did it! I burst into tears. Marley, we won! said Mother. But I couldn't stop crying. I thought winning the election would solve everything. But now that the big day was here, I realized it wasn't the end after all. It wasn't even close. New board members need to be appointed by the Pulaski County Board of Education. There were legal challenges to integration in the courts. Even if the high school stood open, Liz and I still wouldn't be at the same school. What is it? asked Daddy. Tears of, of joy, I lied. And my parents seemed to believe me. I called Liz again before I went to school, but this time no one answered. All morning I couldn't wait for lunch to come so Mr. Harding and I could do some math and forget about everything except algebra. But when I pulled out my book and tried to do the first problem, I couldn't copy it down correctly because my eyes kept filling with tears. What's wrong, Marley? Mr. Harding asked gently. Have you ever looked forward to something for a long time and then when you finally got what you wanted, it wasn't what you expected? Mr. Harding nodded. I'm happy we won, I said. So how come I don't feel better? He looked thoughtful and said nothing for a long moment. Then put old out a pencil and started to write in the blank piece of paper I had before me. I think what's happened, Marley, is that you've realized the world isn't an addition problem. He wrote three plus four equals seven down on the paper. We tell kids that sometimes. We pretend the world is straightforward, simple, easy. You do this, you get that. You're a good person and try your best and nothing bad will happen. But the truth is, the world is much more like an algebraic equation with variables and changes, complicated and messy. Sometimes there's more than one answer and sometimes there is none. Sometimes we don't even know how to solve the problem. He wrote x squared plus 4x minus 21 equals 0. But usually, if we take things step by step, we can figure things out. 
You just have to remember to factor the equation, break it down into smaller parts. I stared at x squared plus 4x minus 21 equals 0. Pictured it factored into parentheses x minus 3 parentheses, open parentheses x plus 7 close parentheses equals 0. Imagine the solutions, x equals 3 and x equals negative 7, and felt a little better. You're right, Marley. Winning this election isn't the solution, but it's a start. Mr. Harding, I said, yes. At the beginning of the year, I was helping JT cheat on his homework. I know. I looked at him surprised. I grade your homework every day. I recognize your handwriting. Why didn't you say anything, I asked. Mr. Harding shrugged. Oh, I thought it would be better if you told me yourself. I nodded. Are you going to punish me? Yes, he said. I'm going to make you do extra math during your lunchtime. Is that a punishment for her? No. Has she been doing it all along? Yes. I smiled. Now, come on. He pushed the algebra book toward me. Let's start solving the world's problems, one step at a time. I was in the kitchen doing my homework when Liz called me that afternoon. I can only talk for a second, she said. <coughs> she sounded awful. Why, what's wrong? I'm not going to be allowed to see you anymore. Ever. Not even by accident. If we happen to end up in the same place, I have to turn around and leave. And if I don't... Liz couldn't finish. Are you crying? I asked. No, said Liz. But she was. Marley, we were almost killed, said Liz. And not just us, but Curtis and Betty Jean and the pastor and your mother, too. There's nowhere left for us. What are you talking about? We need to find other friends, people we can actually do things with. What? Marley, I don't want you to be lonely. I want you to have friends you can talk and laugh with. And there's no one I like I, I like at school. Then you're not looking hard enough, said Liz. I'm not always a cup of warm milk with a dash of cinnamon. And little Jimmy is more than just apple juice. But I'm sorry, Marley, this is just how it has to be. As long as there are people like Red and Ten, we just can't. I'm sorry. Are you telling me goodbye? I asked. Yes, said Liz. I am. Goodbye, Marley. And she hung up. I sat there for a full minute, staring at the receiver. This was exactly what I'd been afraid of. I went to my room and sat on my bed and thought, looked at the problem from all angles and added things up from all sides. I could come to only one conclusion. Liz was right. Summing people up as a cola or a coffee wasn't really fair. Most people were a whole refrigerator full of different drinks. Trying to force them into one cup or one glass meant I never really got to know them. But Liz was wrong too. As long as there were people like Red in town, it was more important than ever for us to be friends to show all the others who were too afraid that it was possible. I needed her to point out when I was wrong and teach me new things. And I was pretty sure that she needed me too. There had to be a way. Mr. Harding said when you were stuck, you should factor the equation. Liz was too afraid to be friends with me anymore. More. There had to be a part of the problem that I could solve. Some way to give her back the courage she'd given me. Some way to... Red. He was only one part of the equation, but he was a large part. If I could deal with him, maybe it would help, at least a little. Thought and thought and thought. And by the time my parents came home that evening, I had a plan. Dun, dun, dun. Chapter 54. Speaking up. I explained my plan mother and daddy over dinner. I didn't think they would like it much, but at least they, they listened. She's right about one thing, said daddy when I was done. Something does need to be done about Red. Mrs. Dalton isn't a bad woman, mother agreed. Perhaps it wouldn't hurt to talk to her. Maybe we should call the police again, suggested daddy. Mother shook her head. I had Miss Winthrop check our files. Of the pe police officers who live in our district, District 23 signed Cross's petition. Only six signed stops. But if we all want to talk to the Daltons together, Daddy nodded. It's worth a try. So 20 minutes later, my parents and I were knocking on JT's front door. 
A colored man wearing a butler's uniform answered the door. We were hoping to pay a call on Mr. and Mrs. Dalton, said Mother. Are they at home? The man nodded and ushered us still inside. I still had the black feather. It was bent and crumbled, and now that Liz wasn't talking to me, I wasn't sure it had any magic anymore. But it made me feel better as the man led us down the hall and out onto the back porch. Mrs. Dal Mr. Dalton was holding a drink and reading the paper. J.T. and Red were on the lawn, tossing a football back and forth. Mrs. Dalton sat in the corner, sipping an iced tea and reading a book. J.T. dropped the football when he saw us. Mr. Nisbet, Mr. Dalton said, what did we do to gain the pleasure of this visit? His voice made it clear it was anything but a pleasure. Mr. Dalton, said Daddy, I'm not sure you were aware of the recent events involving your son, Raymond Edward Dalton. I'd always wondered where Red got his nickname since he didn't have red hair. It was silly when parents gave their kids names that spelled that that had initials that spelled words. Like Daisy O Ursula Montgomery, which is or Peter Ivan Galveston. Pig. No, I wouldn't drift off. I was gonna listen. Listen to every word until it was time to do my part. And then I would talk. The police were already here this morning, said Mr. Dalton. Again. We all turned to look at Red. But he stood still, as calm as can be. It was J.T. who looked afraid. I wondered for the first time what it would be like to have an older brother like Red. Someone you loved because they were your own flesh and blood. But someone who was nasty, too. Sometimes even horrible to you. And I remembered how when J.T. was in third grade, he fell out of his treehouse and broke his leg. At least that's what he said. But I remember being surprised because it was a nice tree house with walls all around the top. If you were clumsy, maybe you could fall out. But J.T. wasn't clumsy. If your brother was mad at you, though, it'd be really easy to push you out. J.T. had been in the hospital a long time. Mother even took Sally and me to see them. him. I was nervous because even then J.T. was something of a golden boy, the alpha lion of the pack. Sally chattered a blue streak. I put a vase of daffodils from our garden in the window. Everyone said the doctor did a fabulous job and that his leg healed perfectly. But that wasn't true. After a long day of school, sometimes, maybe if it was about to rain, JT had a slight limp. <clears throat> Once last year, coming off the football field, I saw him rubbing his hip when he thought no one was watching. Everyone assumed he wanted to be just like his brother. But what if he didn't? What if he'd rather be someone else? The police came to talk to my son, repeated Mr. Dalton, pulling me out of my thoughts again. And they accused him of throwing a bomb through a poor Negro's front window. Now I assured them my son would never waste his time on such a prank. And seeing as how there was no evidence anyway, the good officer agreed and apologized for wasting our time. So what I'm wondering is, why are you all here to bring this up again? A father would be no help. Our daughter was trapped in the trunk of your son's car while she was removing the dynamite Red had stored there. Mother's voice was calm and clear, but her hand was shaking. My son never stored dynamite in the truck of his car, said Mr. Dalton. Though he did recently have the lock broken off, had to get a new one installed. I don't suppose your daughter would know anything about that. I counted two, three, five said. Yes, I do. For the first time, Mr. Dalton looked surprised. I, I broke it off with a letter opener, I continued. I'll pay for the lock, but I'd like the opener back. Mrs. Dalton looked up from her book. JT almost smiled. Red had absolutely no reaction at all. Thought you were mute, said Mr. Dalton. No, sir, I said. But as I said, I left the opener in the trunk and I'd like it back. Well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Get out of here, all of you. And if I ever hear one word about this again, I'll have you arrested for slander. Mrs. Dalton stirred her tall iced tea. I thought of that time we spent together stuffing envelopes. I waited for her to say something, but she didn't. The butler held the door open for my father. Out! Mr. Dalton barked again. I began to see why Red had turned out the way he had. 
I looked over at JT. Please, I whispered. JT held my gaze for a long time, then went over to his mother and touched her arm. Mama, he said, Marley is a square, but she's not a liar. Red turned, as red as his name. Mrs. Dalton reached up and ran her fingertips across her scar. Go, said Mr. Dalton. Mother took my arm and started to leave me off. No, said Mrs. Dalton. She rose from her seat, clutching JT's hand. What? snapped Mr. Dalton. I'd, I'd like to see if this girl is telling the truth. Why? asked Mr. Dalton. It's, it's a simple matter to check. Mrs. Dalton's voice was growing stronger. Let's go look in the trunk of Red's car. If there's a letter open in there, I'll believe her story. If not, you can call the police. Red shrugged, and I suddenly had the awful feeling that he'd already found the letter opener and thrown it away. But maybe he'd only found the handle. Maybe the blade was still there. Mr. Dalton sighed. Fine, let's go settle this once and for all. But afterwards, you have one minute to get off my property before I call the police. So we marched back through the house and out to the car in the driveway. Mr. Dalton glanced at Red and he unlocked the trunk without protest. We all crowded around to look inside. There was nothing there. Mrs. Dalton sighed in relief. Red grinned. Mr. Dalton just crossed his arms. Satisfied? He snapped. I wasn't. I knew it had been Red, and before anyone could stop me, I jumped back into the trunk. Get your crazy daughter out of my... Daddy held the lid open so I wouldn't get trapped. I bent down and pulled back the lining of the truck. trunk. There, in a crack in the side, something silver flashed. I reached in and pulled out a slip of metal. Daddy held me, helped me out of the trunk, and I held it out. Mr. Dalton clenched his teeth. Red, what is the meaning of this? It, it's just a piece of metal, said Red with a shrug. I don't know where it came from. I turned the metal so they could all see my name engraved in the bl blade, shining yellow in the setting sun. Red lunged at me, trying to grab it away, but his own father held him back. Red broke free and spat on the ground. Mr. Dalton's face was bright red. What the hell are you thinking? I didn't know they were going to be there, snapped Red. I was only after the colored girl. I saw her go into that house and thought that was where she lived. You said yourself she deserved... Shut up, roared Mr. Dalton. Get in the house before... No, said Red. His bang fell into his eyes and he pouted. It made him look about five years old. I'm still bigger than you, boy, said Mr. Dalton. And there's a switch in the back closet I'm not afraid to use. Red's eyes blazed with hatred, but he turned and slunk into the house. Mr. Dalton followed him without even glancing at the rest of us. Mother, Daddy, JT, Mrs. Dalton, and I were left standing awkwardly on the sidewalk. Finally, Daddy cleared his throat. I'm afraid we're going to have to call the police. Mrs. Dalton nodded. I know. JT was staring at the ground. I walked over to him. You okay, JT? He looked as shocked as I'd felt after the bombing. No, he said. I never really thought he did it. I took his hand and held it for a moment. Come on, Marley, said Mother. It's time to go. And unfortunately, we don't have time to finish the book. What? We have two more chapters plus the author. And cut.